Hello and welcome to uh, session three of the Conversationalist uh, uh, Winter Webinar Series nurtured by the Robinia Institute um, that seeks to foster and nurture intensely deep and uh, richly philosophical conversations around the co-creation of a much more beautiful world. Today, November 23rd uh, webinar is called Balancing East and West rediscovering human scale and place centric agriculture. We have the true and uh, rich pleasure of having Joel Salatin of Polyface Farm with us this afternoon, a man who needs or probably even really wants any introduction. Joel, welcome to the conversation list. Thank you, Daniel. It's an honor and a privilege and a real pleasure to be with you. Absolutely. Let's uh, before we before we dive in, let's set some context of where we've been in, in this series so we kind of understand where we're going next. Uh, session one back in October, uh, we had Brandon Sheard, uh, who runs the Farmstead Meatsmith, and uh, he was with us. We discussed the need for cultivating tradition and habit in order to descale the seemingly ever scaling regenerative movement. The week, uh, there are two weeks after that for session two, uh, we had the pleasure of talking with Alan Savory, who discussed uh, the rededicating to first principles, if you will, the budding regenerative movement that was uh, so needed for the moment. It was a conversation we had uh, the same day Alan got to present to the COP26 conference uh, for, um, and, and so that was an amazing, amazing conversation. Those two conversations are recorded uh, they're on a podcast and on video form on our website that you guys can all go back and listen to uh, at your leisure, robiniainstitute.com. Okay, today, Joel, uh, we are talking about balance, a, a term uh, seemingly omnipresent uh, in Eastern thought, uh, but not so entirely apparent uh, in what we should just plainly talk, call Western literature. Um, I actually want to start this conversation off by quoting you, and I think that this quote that I'm th blindly going to throw at you here, uh, you wrote this last year, but it's really the foundation of this, of this topic, this, this, this webinar, when, when we asked you to be a part of it, this is really where um, that ask uh, you know, came from. But I'll read you a quote and you'll see what we go from there. But Joel, last year you wrote, giving ourselves time to imagine beauty and spontaneous dynamic being in and around us helps us find balance. All my life, I've struggled to find balance. All my life, I've struggled balancing out my Western reductionist linear bias with an Eastern holistic connectedness. Uh, beauty, spontaneous and dynamic being. Let's start there. Joel, uh, we'll get to agriculture, I promise. But if you can, what does beauty, spontaneity, and dynamic being have to do with balance, and, and why is that important? Well, I think I think it's um, I think the, the critical element here is uh, to appreciate that I am a I am a part of something. I'm not hovering over it. I, I think um, the the, the the kind of mechanistic Western approach. Uh, which which has brought us you know electricity the internal combustion engine and 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 computers uh, you know so so I, I don't demonize the West but but I, um, I I very much appreciate the the boundaries the boundaries that are set when we don't just run um, whatever uh, Without ethics, without morality, without an understanding of that, I'm a part of a dynamic of a dynamic uh, uh, thing here. Uh, when, when we view ourselves as a bit a part of that, uh, 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 not not a part, but a part, uh, you know, uh, uh, dis disconnected from it. And um, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm I'm reminded of the fact that um, uh, some land grant universities, if they have been studying, for example, how to isolate the the uh, stress D DNA of a pig so that they can breed pigs with no stress DNA. That way they can they can they can force them, manipulate them, 
more grossly than you can imagine, but the pig won't be stressed about it. And, and, and you know, I, I'm struck by the fact that, that how we handle, uh, you know, life in general is how we handle each other. And so if we're gonna, if we're gonna view pigs, <laughs> pigs as that, uh, whatever, mechanistic, then we're probably going to view each other as also mechanistic. And, um, and so it has these, these very broad ramifications. And so, so, um, yeah, for, for me, it's, uh, you know, growing up with this kind of, you know, Western conservative Western, uh, paradigm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to admit, I'm happy to admit that I'm struck daily by the, the majesty, the mystery, and the awesomeness um, that, that, that I'm immersed in that I don't control, that I didn't make, that I didn't build, mm. you know, that I didn't fabricate. Uh, that, that, that's, a, I think that's a, that's a good, that's a good frame of reference to be in. Got it. Yeah. Last, last week, Alan, as, as you know, I know you, you and Alan are long and old time friends. Um, we talk a lot about the holistic context when it comes down to managing any system or, or systems, um, you know, holistically. And, and, and that's a lot of what, you know, the holistic context talks about, but in order not, in order to step away from that conversation, not to rehash a conversation already, I think well hashed, um, let, let's dive you. So you said let's step away from the holistic context is my point, um, ethics, morality, and understanding connectedness. Those are the three words that really stuck out to me in, in that answer. And, um, you know, as we shift our, our mentality just from, you know, more of a 30,000 foot view of understanding this, this Eastern holism, Western reductionism, and the understanding of balance, let's kind of dive into something a little bit more practical here, place-centric agriculture. Um, you know, Aldo Leopold, I'm sure you've you got plenty of books behind you. I'm sure you're a big, big fan or at least have read his work well. Yes. Um, you know, he talked about the land ethic, right, mm -hmm. which is where ethics and, and, and perhaps even morality is this, is this connectedness, this meeting ground between human action and a landscape's function uh, beyond just a simple ecosystem functionality of, of, of that system. But, you know, there's something more there, right? He called it the land ethic. Um, I mean, where, where, where does that play? I mean, you wrote many books and I want to ask a very particular question here. Uh, there's two of them that I read one many, many years ago, uh, you can farm or everyone can farm. I apologize. The, the title uh, is not perfect, but I, I think, you know, the book I'm talking about, Yeah. Um, you know, and you've been down that way, right? I mean, you've, I think it's a brilliant book. It helped us when we started Tim Schull Wildland, our farm here in, in Nelson County, just over the mountain from you. And so we thank you for that. But, but talk to me not about how we can farm, uh, but the question is, how should we farm in view of ethics, morality, connectedness, and this understanding of balance? Yeah, what a great, what a great question. Uh, you know, I, I think that the, when people ask me, what's your bottom line? My bottom line is, he, is about healing. Uh, you know, we don't, we don't live in a perfect, what, a, a perfect state, a perfect universe, a perfect, you know, there, there's tornadoes and floods and, and droughts and, and uh, uh, blizzards and whatever. Uh, you know, there's, there is hardship, there's catastrophe, there's, there's difficulty. And so, um, so the, the, I think the driving thing, I mean, we have it on our, on our um, bags in our, you know, our farm store, uh, our little moniker healing, healing the land one bite at a time. And so, so the first part of that is healing the land. We, in other words, we, everything we do is about, is about healing the land. Uh, you could even say, we want our footsteps to leave more commons than was here before we came. Well, what are the commons? Um, you know, I, I'm probably the only libertarian on the planet that, that, that consistently uses the term commons, but, uh, but but the, the, the commons is the air, the soil, the water. Uh, we could even say it, it, there's cultural equity there as well. You know that, that it, it, it's 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 equity and resource that predated us and will outdate us as we come and go in our pilgrimage. And so um, so am I leaving more soil? Am I hydrating the landscape or dehydrating it? 
uh, am I am I eroding or building more soil? Am I leaving the air you know more breathable and better than than it was before? You know, uh, and it extends to other things as well. I mean, um, you know, am I am I leaving happier earthworms that, than were here before I was here? Uh, you know, th those kinds of questions um, create th this ethical moral framework on how we interact with this with this ecological umbilical that we're completely dependent on. And so when we say, how should we farm, um, that, that frames it. If, if I'm farming in a way that depletes soil, that depletes water, that poisons things, that leaves a, a dead zone the size of Rhode Island in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, that reduces pollinators, that, you know, you, you can go down this line that, that, that's toxic to earthworms, all right? Um, you know that's that's not that's not an ultimately healing thing. Now it's important to realize before we get you know if I could just mention this as a little uh, kind of a, a postscript on this answer uh, on this idea, uh, healing is not always pain free. Uh, you know some healing, uh, you know you got to you got to do some surgery sometimes, or you have to you know you you got to do some. Uh, uh, some herbology or something, right? Uh, you know, maybe some stretching and, and exercise. And so I, I appreciate you using uh, Aldo Leopold, who also wrote in San, Cal San County Almanac that, uh, you know, deer are the enemy of the forest. I just think that's hilarious, you know, that here this great naturalist said deer are the enemy of the forest. And, and what he was, he, he wasn't wanting to exterminate deer. Uh, what he was su suggesting was that, that that there is a there is a management necessary to create this healing, um, just like you and I. If we want to be healthy, we we can't just we can't just lie in bed inert and expect to be healthy. Uh, we have to move. We have to eat. We have to stretch that sore muscle. You know, we we uh, and, and that that's a part of this healing. And so healing comes in, in numerous forms, but, but the, the long range trajectory of our procedures needs to be toward a healing path, not a, not a, a, a hurting or dysfunctional path, you know, on, on a long horizon. Uh, I, I think for me, that's kind of the, you know, the bottom line. Right. Yeah. That's, it's, it, I, I like that you, now brought up the Sam County Almanac deer saying, um, because I think it does, it comes back to balance, right? Yeah. Um, a, a, an oak forest, right? A dry mixed oak forest, let's say in the temperate climate here mm -hmm. uh, with too much deer doesn't have oak regeneration. You don't have hickory right. regeneration. You have don't, you know, the, you have fat deer, right? Yeah. But you, it, yeah. <laughs> without fat coyotes, wolves or mountain lions, right? That's just an right. extensive problem. That's just an extensive problem. And so we come back to balance. Mm -hmm. And so um, let's bring that back even one step further, if we can, understanding balance in, in terms of managing for healing, which is what, the, what, what you were talking about. So balance in regard to management for healing. Um, can we go too far, right? So let me ask a, a good question. Can our focus be too much on healing that we create an imbalance within our community, within our societal systems, within our personal relationships, within our person ourselves, within the environments in which we interact, that actually becomes degenerative. Is, is that possible? Or, or do you wanna comment on the possibility of that happening? Uh, you know, I think that that is an interesting, um, that in, is an interesting question. Uh, boy, it's, um, I like it when I get new questions. I, I always thought, you know, very seldom, as much talking and speaking as I've done, you know, usually I don't get new questions. That is that is a new one. So kudos to you. For, yeah, you can take time on it. I don't I don't mean to put you on a spot just to have yeah, a conversation for, with you. Yeah, for going there. Um, I, I, I think I think that we can I will say this, that we can get obsessed. I'm going to use a different term than healing. I'm going to use the term altruism mm. uh, that, that we that we can we can become so altruistic in thought <laughs> that we become dysfunctional in outcome. For sure, um, I see this. For example, uh, I'll give you a very practical example. I get calls all the time uh, around the country. Somebody, you know, I can't sell my. You know, people won't. 
uh, buy these chickens, blah, 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 you know, and, and how do you sell your chickens? And, um, and so I, you know, I ask them a little bit and often, more often than not, these kinds of calls are coming from somebody who's using a, an exotic heritage breed, uh, uh, narrow breasted, slow growing, you know, uh, all dark meat and they're selling it for 50 bucks a chicken and, <laughs> and, 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 and they're, and they're, they're floundering. Um, we've, we've seen this with gardeners who, who are obsessed about, for example, you know, heritage, um, heritage things. I mean, we service a lot of restaurants. I don't know how many chefs have told me, look, I like some exotic tomatoes, you know, some Peruvian, some Peruvian uh, blue fingerling potatoes. I love that, but I use it as a garnish. What I need, I need five bushels a week of just good compost grown Kennebec potatoes, you know? Um, and, and, and so, and so I am very quick to, uh, to admit our own, like a, our own hypocrisies and, and admit that we have chosen those for the overall, and this is, man, it's such a good question because look, if I go bankrupt, being altruistic, all that proves is that the world is not as altruistic as I am. <laughs> well, we already know that. <laughs> yeah. I don't have to go right. back to prove it. And, 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 and so, so, you know, on our farm, we actually do grow the Cornish cross, double-breasted industrial Tyson, you know, genetic chicken. But guess what? Our, our goal is the, the first step, we feel like the first step in healing is to uh, is to indict with a credible alternative the entire factory farming mechanism. Let's start there. Once we dismantle that, then we can move on to other things. And so I don't know if that answers the question, uh, but I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm playing with it at least. You, you got to give me credit for playing with it. Um, that, that, that yes, I think we can get in our own way uh, when we're too, when, when we become so purist that we that we can't make strategic compromises for the well-being of, of the larger organism, and and we know we know that that people only change so fast. Uh, you know, I was an old uh, uh, high school and college debater. Uh, I was on the debate team and, and all these things. And, and one of the things you learn in persuasion is that if you have a scale of one to ten, let's say, you know, it, it, let's just say food. Uh, a, a one, a one is a person who eats most of their food from the filling station. <laughs> all right. And a 10 is a person who grows their own garden, has backyard chickens and, you know, butchers their own rabbits. Okay. All right. So that's a one to 10. Well, in persuasion, you never, you never try to move a one to a 10 quickly. You go incrementally. And if you move the, the gas station, you know, food guy, to you know, uh, uh, getting some some unprocessed apples at Walmart—that's a step in the right direction. And we celebrate those increments. And um, uh, you know th that that to that to me brings brings balance because you're looking at the whole at the totality of the of the context, as Alan would say, or the or the culture, as uh, you know, and, and you're saying, what can we do? to move the whole train forward a little bit, um, w you know, without, without sacrificing ourselves, uh, you know, in, in the process of getting there. And it, it, it's not an easy question. Every, everybody, I would say we all make our compromises, you know, and, it, and it's not all, it's that it, your compromise might be different than others. And, and it's difficult for me. Uh, it's easy for me to, to, um, say well, well you know to judge your compromises well that's the wrong compromise mine's the right compromise you know we get we get in all this uh you know uh, tit for tat back and forth but um but but i think i think it's a great question um and, and i don't have the answer but I, I i i i play with it yeah well that's that's all that's all we ever do um you know is play with it i i, I think your answer is brilliant i think it, it also highlights um you know, you talked a lot about the farm business and revenue and staying on the farm and, and offering a, a factory farming alternative. And that's your context, right? That, that's, that's where your focus is. That's, that's, you know, that's your steps toward the healing. 
you know, I'm thinking of a lot of farmers that I know who get burnt out after only a couple of years, right? Because they start off on this family farm and they're raising cattle, pigs, and sheep. And then all of a sudden now there's cattle, pigs, sheep, and chickens, and there's food forests, and then there's gardens, and then there's orchards, right? And they're going to all these different farmers markets, but the human side hasn't scaled, you know, with, with the operation. Their focus oh. is on a multi-species operation, but it's not a multi-human operation. Right. And so, um, you know, maybe that's an, a, an appropriate next question. And, and, and the title of this webinar is, right, place-centric and human scale, right? The idea that the, these are two different, in my opinion, entities, systems, if you will, processes that kind of combat each other, right? Human scale kind of tries to keep you in, in this and place-centric is, is, is limiting you in other ways. But the question here is this. In order, to, in order to truly run a, a balanced agricultural operation, and now I'm only talking about agriculture, this probably pertains to other industries as well, but my focus is on agriculture. As you become multi-species, right, in order to maintain a balanced lifestyle, a lifestyle that in some way affects positively the healing or the, 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 um, the pathway towards healing the local community, your local family, whatever that is, what does the human side have to do uh, to, to meet that balanced life? Yeah. Talk about that. Yeah, that, that's one that I've certainly... Uh, uh, dug into a lot and i would just say you know my my first uh reaction to that is always this um whatever uh, a difficult <laughs> challenge that you cannot have a sustainable farm unless unless you have two salaries going to two different generations mm. um so 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 succession um that, that's the that's the human scale here uh the, the if you don't have a person grabbing your baton uh th th that can move it forward then there really is no is no succession plan because we don't all stay you know as youthful as you are and, right. and so so uh, you know, eventually you're going to hit 70, 80 years old, and you're not going to do what you've been doing today. So many farms, way too many farms run the, you know, the, the life cycle trajectory of, of age, of, of aging out. And of course, we're seeing that in American farmers today. And so, um, so then, then people jump on me and say, well, okay, so you're, you know, uh, you're asking for, uh, uh, you know, big farms. No, no. You can generate two salaries off a pretty small farm. Uh, there's a lot of difference between a, a two salary enterprise and a, you know, a, a Tyson. Um, <laughs> and, and in fact, in fact, as you know, uh, even most farmers who grow chickens for Tyson um, are only one, you know, one family operations. Okay. And so, so uh, I would say two things. One is, one is if you really want a um, you know a a balanced uh, uh, if we say if we say that balance in this case is equivalent to legacy, if you want a legacy um, operation, then you need to be thinking about how to create a second income. Then secondly, you need to be thinking about can that second income come from somebody that's younger than I am. If somebody gets hurt, there's somebody to, to you know, cross train to take over. If there's, uh, if somebody needs to be away or whatever, if somebody, you know, uh, dies, whatever. The other aspect of this multi, you know, this, this place centric uh, multi-speciation that of course, you know, we're all uh, keyed into is that normally um, gifts and talents to, 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 to produce a certain thing uh, are, are concentrated. In, in fact, normally anim, people, people tend toward animals or plants. And even within plants, they tend toward annuals like vegetables versus perennials like bramble fruits and orchard. E even those are, are broken down. And so generally, I mean, we have a sign posted in our farm office um, uh, that almost always success requires working with someone you wouldn't normally work with um, because you need complementary skill sets. You need complementary um, uh, passions and interests and, and, and craft 
And so, um, so how we do this is we, we craft our farm business so that it, so that it, it wants to, I, I'm trying to push it's not reluctant, but actually wants to, you, you can feel, you can feel the farm. I don't get all mystical on you, but, but you can feel the farm asking for more, asking for more people, asking for more diversity, asking for more economic enterprises. And, and if we, if we, as, as caretakers, caretakers of this ec ecological womb, if, if we come to it with a sense that of desire that, that, that the land desires more. Um, uh, I'm gonna, you know, that, that, that gets, that gets pretty deep for me. Um, yeah. it, th that when the land desires more, um, you know, it's a different thing. I, I, the, 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 the typical farmer, and of course I love farmers, but I'll tell you the typical commercial farmer that I know does not view the ecology as as a lover but rather as an adversary an adversary to be you know to be uh um wrestled <laughs> wrestled into some sort of production you know yeah yeah uh, wrestled is a nice word but yeah, yeah. Can, you're good continue right well you could say rape too but, yeah. but, but anyway uh you could. You know, at least at least wrestled okay whereas whereas what a different view to view it as an actual a, a lover that just wants to be caressed in the right places that wants to please it. It, it wants to please. It wants to create abundance. Um, and, and, and that's a real different mindset to come to it. Uh, and, and I don't hear those conversations down at the sale barn or the, <laughs> the feed, the feed mill, you know, those conversations yeah. are happening. And I'm really appreciative that you are, you are creating a platform to, to have a conversation at that, at that level. Yeah. Well, no, let's, let's, let's keep going down that then. So you're talking about land as a lover, which I love. Um, I had a professor in college uh, who used to walk in to class. He was this older Hungarian gentleman, one of the true mentors of my life. He used to walk in, he would smell a book and he would talk about the books, you know, are his, he has yeah. a lover type relationship to his books and it was beautiful. It, I mean, yeah. Yeah. I, I, to me, it was beautiful anyways, but I, I love that, that we have the same relationship to the land because as you said in the beginning, we're not, we're not, you know, a dictators above of this created order, right? Where we get to right. play with puppets and everything else. We are a part of, right? right. Not apart from, but a part yeah. of. Mm -hmm. and, and so in that sense, we get to interact as, as lovers would interact. And I, I love that. Um, cycling back the understanding of balance, though. To me, I, so I'm married. Uh, I have three children. And, and to me, love is something that it must be balanced. Right. And, and, and as my wife and I, we, we, we grow older together, although we are quite young, we've been together for about a decade. It, there's, there's more of a balanced relationship that's emerging with time, right. In the beginning, right. As everybody knows, everybody who's ever been in love or whatever it would be, um, you know, it's, it, it's fast and, and it's exciting. And, and there's, there's all of that jubilation in the beginning, but then balance occurs. Right. And, and when that balance occurs, and I mean that only positively, health occurs. So, OK, taking that analogy, bringing it back to the land, um, address this for me. As a farmer, if a farmer were to take up a role as a lover of landscapes, right, connected to place, I'm going back to session one of this of this webinar series. I'm thinking about Brandon Sheard, understanding of, of understanding the habits and traditions of your local landscape being so connected that you are truly a part of your local ecology, economy, right, social, economic, whatever it is, just connected in every certain way. How does balance mediate Westerns, uh, the Western linear reductionist mind? How does it balance our tendency to dominate? Right, because in relationships, you know, I, we are still human, right? We 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 still accidentally or on purposely try to dominate for selfish reasons for whatever it is. H how does this understanding of balance mod modulate or 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 you know even balance out to use the term again our relationship to the land as lovers? Yeah, oh, what a again very very uh, uh, prescient. So the the I think the answer there is is um, discussion, is, is, is no secrets. Uh, in other words, you, well, actually you're trying to discover secrets. You're, you're, um, I like that. So, so, we, so 
part of what we have to do as stewards, as stewards, as caretakers, is to discover the secrets that that a piece of land that maybe we've been entrusted with um, has to offer us. You know, permaculture in, in permaculture in, uh, in Bill Mollison when he was and and Dave Holmgren when they were formulating that one of their axioms was when you get when when you come to a new property don't do anything for one year but but go walk it um you know this was before the time of uh, ATVs and <laughs> four and, wheelers and said, yeah. walk it walk it every month for tw- for 12 months and take your notebook and note where you know where water runs where it's dry where there are wild grapevines where the snow melts faster, where the snow drifts higher, you know, if you're obviously in a snow area, uh, where are the, where are the walnut trees? Where are the pine trees? Where is, is there a spring? Is there a marsh? Is there, you know, I'm, I could just go on, but, but, but all these features, these features and, and, and we could say secrets, secrets of, of the land. And, and, and after a year, then, you know, then you can start to start to address it. But uh, you 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 purchase to yourself license to touch after you've discovered secrets, mm. and and so uh, one of the big problems we have in agriculture is that so many decisions, so many decisions are being made from far away. And Wendell Berry writes about this uh, that that. You know, I mean, th- think about think about GPS driverless uh, tractors. You know, um, uh, where somebody has determined this amount of fertil- chemical fertilizer is necessary for this land to yield this amount of soybeans, and so this driverless tractor is programmed at a console with information that's been that's been uh, uh, amalgamated. <coughs> you know, whoever, wherever, in, in some, you know, some uh, cerebral place uh, in a lab somewhere. And, and this driverless, humanless tractor is moving across the landscape, um, running on GPS satellite technology with a database that's, that's literally intravenously giving material into the land from somebody who has never seen it walked on it been a part of it or, or anything and and so uh i mean the same thing is true like i could give an example in uh, in cattle in, in livestock right now uh as you know uh daniel the um you know the the size of cows have become huge um yeah you know the, i mean they in the 1950s they were a thousand pounds and today it's not uncommon to to find 1600 pound cows massive massive cow right. um, in fact uh, yeah I, I saw one not uh, last year actually a neighbor that had put on a scale that weighed 2100 pounds a cow this wasn't a bull this was a cow all right so so why has that come well it's become because the packing industry that fabricates it's more efficient to fabricate pounds of material when when the initial package is is big than when it's small if you're going to set up a a a, a meat a meat slicer um if if you get an extra two ribeye steaks for example on the one meat slicer setting that's more efficient than you know it's more efficient to get 12 than 10 on on a setting and so the, the 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 packaging industry which is you know centralized and 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 uh you know uh, uh handled by bean counters and and mba students that are then liable to a bunch of investment bankers right they are telling the farmer i want a 1600 pound cow now you and i both know that in a a gentle in a low maintenance um healthy uh, grass-based non 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 interventive you know low veterinary low health costs low cat you know all these things we don't want a 1600 pound cow there, there there's not an ecosystem in the world 
that will naturally support a 1600 pound cow. And so here the farmer is making decisions about bulls and genetics and what to keep and, and, what, and, and what kind of calf to save. And all those decisions are being made, they're being filtered down from a packing industry, never seen the cow, never seen the land, never, never uh, talked about, you know, the farmer's context. But, but, but the farmer, because the, because the industry pays a premium for that kind of animal, the farmer then makes completely uh, um, irrational decisions from an, from an ecology and a health standpoint. The farmer makes irrational decisions because of what has filtered down from, from far away. And, and, and we, we see that. Uh, I mean, uh, we see that in farming, we see that in a, in a lot of places of life where, where we are, rather than localizing our, our response, um, we're actually globalizing our response. And, and what we're chasing is efficiency, but we're losing resiliency. Um, there was an interesting, there was an interesting uh, report that came out lately. Somebody, somebody took the British House of the, the British Parliament and looked back, uh, I think it was five or six years, and they, they took all the, whatever, the, the speeches in Parliament and found all the uses of the word uh, either efficient or efficiency versus resilient and resiliency. And in the last five years, Efficient and efficiency has dropped by half the number, of the, the use of those terms, and the words resilient or resiliency have doubled. So they've actually, so, you know, the, the world is beginning to appreciate as when things become jittery, that's when people start thinking about resilience rather than efficiency. And, uh, and resilience actually actually speaks to, to balance. You know, the Ranching for Profit School, you know, they talk about, uh, Stan Parsons always talked about hitting the bullseye of the wrong target. You know, we're, we're, boy, we're, you know, we're, we're making great big cows, but is that, you know, is that, is that target? Right, right, absolutely. I love that. Discussions, you said in the beginning of, of that, discussions to discover secrets, right? And, and, and that yeah. is a big part. This, this webinar series, it's actually based upon, I don't know if you know this, it's based upon Wendell Berry's essay, uh, nature as measure, in, in which he says, in agriculture that sees ourselves as a part of creation and not as dictators over it, approaches agriculture, approaches our, their job as the agriculturalist, the farmer, as a conversationalist, not a conqueror, right? That's right. And so that's 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 really interesting. I, I love that when I was when I was listening to you talking about the drive the the tractors that have GPS automatic GPS systems. I'm thinking about it being like, you know, it. I'm even, I'm thinking as far back as Masanobu Fukuoka's One Straw Revolution, which I'm sure you know well, uh -huh. where he laments that the, the, the modern state of agriculture, chemical dependence, right? This is the 1940s or 30s, 40s, 50s when he's writing yes. in this moment, that that's the legacy he's talking about. And obviously it's, it's, it's much worse today, but he, he's lamenting over the modern state of agriculture, not because of its chemical dependence or globalization of the localized understanding of, of the farmer as lover of, 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 you know, the local ecosystem and, and such, but he laments because the farmer doesn't have time to write poetry, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, like, that's literally where it goes. And I think we can have a whole conversation around that, but listening to the driver or the, the tractor that drives itself, I'm thinking about the eradication of moments, right? When I think to my life as a farmer, and I think you could probably say something similar when you think about your life as a farmer, it, we live in moments, right? That this morning, right? I saw a cow off to the side and I thought, oh, maybe a calf. And I walked over there, right? And it, it was a moment, right? And, and there was no calf, uh, but we celebrated the moment. We live in these moments when agriculture becomes repetitive, when agriculture becomes automated, right? When it becomes global and it works back down to the local instead of the local, right? And impacting the local economy that then grows and escalates through that journey that you were talking about from one to 10 originally between gas station food and everybody makes their own food. It, it works through that from the local to the global. And today it's obviously backwards, but it's that eradication of moments, right? It's that poetry doesn't exist in the agricultural landscape. Right. And um, yeah, you know, uh, the, the, the whole seasonality of things, 
uh, is a big deal. We, we have, as you know, we raised pastured, a lot of pastured chickens here, and we only do it six months of the year. Six months we have them, six months we don't because we get snow and it gets cold and all that. And, um, and we, we have been pushed by numerous clients over the years. I want them fresh all winter. And, and, um, and number one, we, we, we can't raise them on pasture in the winter because the it's, chickens and snow don't mesh very well. So we'll put them in a house. Well, then we'll, when, when are we going to rest? You know, and we've, we've always said uh, we're, we're so glad to see the last chicken go because we're, we're rich and tired as we are to see the first chicken come in the spring because we're rested and poor. And, and that, that whole, that whole cyclical seasonality of it. Um, uh, when I think of these, you know, these industrial farmers, especially factory, you know, animal, animal farmers, uh, more than crop farmers, they kind of do do a, you know, have a, a kind of a cyclical thing. Um, they're, it's just, there's no rest. There's no rest. It's, it's just sprint. It's sprint every day. And uh, my mentor, Alan Nation, founder of Stockman Grass Farmer, always used to say that that's one reason, two things on that. He said, well, that's one reason why he said dairy, far dairy farmers were the least innovative of all the farmers because they never have time to sit down and think. You know, they're, they're milking twice a day and, you know, they never, have, and, and secondly, he said that that's why, that's why the, um, you know, the sustainable regenerative ag community is led in the north, not in the south, because in the north, you have to come in in the winter and sit down and ask why in the south, you know, you just, you just go out and, you know, uh, uh, yeah, and you keep planting and you keep going. And, and mm -hmm. so that, that time, that time, that human personal time to yeah. sit, sit by the fire, read and think and uh, contemplate is, is, is just, it's just as valuable as, yes. as, as getting out. And as we say, uh, get her done. Right. Right. That's, that's interesting. Let, let's shift um, using what we've discovered here. I mean, so balance can balance be perceived as a limit. Um, that that's the question. I'll, I'll tell a quick little story. I was on a conversation recently with a fella who was approaching regenerative agriculture and the movement that is, you know, this soil matters sort of life that we live today uh, from a, from a technology perspective. Um, he was inquiring, hey, where, where's the confluence between agriculture, regenerative agriculture and technology, but high technology? I'm talking, you know, things about tractors that drive themselves and technology that puts all of these things together and, you know, whatever, grows food for us and, and such. And, and, and my question back to him was, uh, until technology can define its limits, right, until, until it can actually look at its surroundings and say, this is my boundary, and I operate within this boundary and the operations that I have within this boundary are health. They are health itself. Um, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure I have a comment, right? Because to me, an agriculture that is place centric is balanced due to its natural limits and such a natural limit. And, and this, by the way, you know, if there is a confluence between Eastern holism and Western reductionism, right? If there's an actual balanced middle ground between the two, um, I, I think it's here. Um, Western thought, we talk a lot about property, right? The American founding, don't need to go too much into it for, to, for this to turn into a history lesson or political science lesson. But basically American founding is built upon the premise, right? That mankind's most sacred right to property, which is obviously apparent, is how we think, our, our conscious. That's James Madison. Mm -hmm. um, but anyways, our, our property, right, that we understand from a Western perspective is what limits, right, our Eastern idea of balance, right? Limits are the balancing factor. Uh, a lot of that is to say this. Let's talk about it limits as balance, right? You don't run my farm, I don't run your farm. And in that way, you and your actions are limited by a certain ecosphere or a biosphere in which we all act. That biosphere is your body. That biosphere is the human family. That biosphere is the social human family that gets bigger, right? And it keeps getting larger and larger. But let's talk about limits and balance. Where, where do you see those things correlating yeah, with each other? Yeah, we, 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 actually, we actually work in that sphere uh, quite a lot here because <clears throat> because we are, as you know, we're a, we're not a homestead a backyard operation. We're, we're a commercial, um, you know, commercial deal and we're, we're entrepreneurs and we, we push, you know, we, we put, and, and routinely 
we get asked to uh, whatever, you know, um, go to, you know, 50,000 laying hens, for example, to do eggs for Whole Foods or whatever, right? And, and we have always turned those down because we don't want to be a chicken farm. We don't want to be a pig farm. We, we, we want it all. We, we want that, that, that production stool. We, we want a lot of legs and we, we don't want to be, you know, a million dollars of eggs and, and $50,000 of beef. We want it to be like $250,000 in eggs, $250,000 in beef, $250,000 in chickens, you know what I'm saying? And, and what we find is that that actually drives the ecology better. For example, on our pastured chickens, they're, we know they're putting down 200 units of uh, nitrogen you know, per, per acre uh, as we move them across the pasture. Well, when you look at kind of how much can the pasture take up, we know that if we overrun that, even though it's manure, it's supposedly organic, um, the fact is, if you put too much nitrogen in the soil, you're going to get weeds. You're going to—it's going to go into groundwater. It's going to leach. It's, it's going to go somewhere because the soil can't metabolize that. And so, when people say, "You mean you only touch a, a square yard once a year with chickens, a whole year rest?" Yes, because that's an ecological balance that you can't exceed, or you move to toxicity. Um, and 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 that. You know that that's that's critical. The, the same thing is critical within within the humans. Um, you know, we are there enterprises we'd like to do. I've got a list this long of enterprises that I'd like to do. Why don't I do them? Because we don't have the people. Uh, if, if somebody came tomorrow and said I'd like to do that enterprise or has a, a complementary enterprise that they would like to do, absolutely. And, and we have structured the farm so that so that people can bring to the table um, new things, new enterprises that they want to do. And guess what? If that person leaves, we don't sit here and, 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 and have a fit because, oh, no, we, 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 we can't do that anymore. We had a, we had a fellow here several years ago, uh, a master um, mushroom grower. And so he developed a mushroom business over two years and then got married and had kids and went back, you know, where both of their families were from. And you can't begrudge that. Well, we didn't fret that, oh, oh no, what are we going to do with these mushrooms? We don't do mushrooms now, you know. And so the farm, the farm actually reflects the gifts, talents, and passions of the humans who are occupying it right now. Next year, it might look different differently next year might look different. suddenly now i'm not i'm not a dictator hiring people for positions i'm actually uh a a germination tray caretaker um offering opportunities for people to blossom within their you know within their 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 um passion and, and love place uh allowing them to germinate their enterprise now we do have our core I mean, we're always going to raise, you know, cows and, you know, we, we have this kind of livestock core, but, but beyond that, uh, th there's a, there's a constant, you know, uh, movement in and out of, of ancillary uh, enterprises that are human, human based to the people that are here. And, um, and, uh, you know, we, we're, we're ready for any, you know, any compatible complementary idea uh, that, that comes along and the person that comes with it. And, and that's, a, you know, that, that's an exciting way to be. It takes a lot of pressure off me. You know, I don't now have to be, make all those decisions and decide what we're going to be. We're going to be, we're going to be a man, a, 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 a manifestation of the human, um, the human desires that happen to be here today. Right. Right. Yeah, it's brilliant. I, I love um, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Uh, he has this quote, we uh, accept the pace of nature and her secret is patience, right? Mm -hmm. That the pace of nature is patience. Yeah. And uh, it, I always, I don't know. I, I mean, one, it's a brilliant quote, but two, it, it's so interesting. Nature, if, if nature does anything, it does something, right? Like leave food on the counter or, um, I mean, just keep going, leave a log on the forest floor. It does something. You can't stop it from doing anything. That's right. But her secret is patience. 
right? And and that that's what I'm getting from you. It's that's it's as we as agriculturalists, right, as farmers who look at the ecology and the economy and the needs of our local social sphere and, and try to produce health or a healthy journey or a journey for better health in those three spheres. It, it, it's not that we must run, right? Balance isn't running, balance isn't walking, balance is patience, whatever that means for you and your farm in this moment today. And it might look different for you next year as you were illustrating. Right, right, that, that, that's, that's exactly right. And, and the, the um, yeah, the whole, uh, the whole ball of wax uh, will vary you know, mm-hmm. from season to season, time to time. And, you know, that's part of, uh, you know, if you're going to add an enterprise, uh, you know, do, do a labor chart. You know, when are you busy? When are you not busy? If you need a little bit of extra income, well, think about an enterprise that you can plug in to your non-busy time. Don't add, I mean, that's one of the reasons we don't do dairy. We're, we're busiest in the summer. We don't want to do summer grass-based dairy because that's when we're already busy anytime. Right. Uh, so, so, you know, what we're adding um, you know, we're th- this year we're really uh, moving forward with adding a lot more saw milling and lumber, uh, lumber and woodworking opportunities, uh, because winters when we're not so busy, and so right. that's how you, you know, that's how you balance out your cash flow. So it's not a big, you know, a, a big spike for two months, and then suddenly you're, you know, you have nothing to sell for ten months. That, right. That's tough. So that's part of, you know, financial balance is, is is part of that as well, which is which speaks to cash flow. Uh, you know, ideally, you want uh, you want something you want something to sell every week, every week of the year. You know, to so you stay in, you, you have a little bit of cash flow. That's why butter and butter and egg money. You know, historically, butter and egg money that that generally was not what kept the farm going, but it was what provided cash flow. It might not have been the major crop, but it but it it, it you know it kept shoes on the feet and 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 the you know the kind of the weekly cash flows. Right. Yeah, that, no, that makes sense. Um, the last five to 10 minutes here, uh, please, if anybody's listening has uh, any questions, please chat them in the chat. I just opened that up. You can also ask them in the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. If you have any questions for Joel uh, that pertain to the conversation today or just questions in general, I mean, outside of asking him for advice, whether or not you should do X, Y, or Z, I'm sure he has no context or time to decide on that in this moment. But uh, please just put those in there and we can uh, dive into those for you. Um, what We have one question that I'm seeing here in the Q&A, Joel. Uh, Jonathan asks, uh, why have we decided to bifurcate between West and East? It sounds more like followers of the way versus deniers of anything outside of uh, anything outside our physical world. Um, I think that's an interesting question. I think, uh, Joel, we got kind of got to that towards the end. Right where this this confluence of east and west, which is, in my opinion, the true east and the true west, comes together, uh, yeah. and this understanding of limits and balance and things. But I don't know if you want to comment. Yeah. Well, I, I would just uh, you know how have we come to bifurcate? Well, I think we've become to bifurcate because um, we humans have numerous fallacies, and one fallacy is we love we love simplicity. We love we love to just we love pigeonholes. We love stereotypes. We love uh, labels, okay. We love labels, and so we want to know. We want to know what it is. Are you a Democrat or Republican or a Libertarian or a you know a socialist? Uh, we, we we do that politically. We do that. Uh, are you a are you a, a, a you know a medical doctor? Are you a holistic medical? Are you a functional medicine? Right. We we we, we love labels be, because they because they provide. Um, they provide order, you know, within our own, within our own minds, right? It, it's hard to have a discussion or talk about things when there's no uh, label or order. And so, um, you know, so generally, uh, you know, the East, which by the way, includes Native Americans. Um, yeah. I'm not, uh, um, I agree. E- Eastern, Eastern thought um, I, mean, I don't think I don't think we need to delve into all the nuances of Eastern thought versus Western thought, but mm-hmm. you know, Eastern thought I think revolves around around um, life, um, connectedness, relationships, and, and and mystery, if you will. Uh, whereas West was trying to 
West is more, um, um, it, it, it's more peace oriented, uh, not P-E-A-C-E, -E, but P-I-E-C-E. -E. It's right. compartmentalized. It, it's, it's more problem solving. Um, it, it's more mechanical. It's, it's parts oriented. And, uh, and uh, so, so what happens is the West has given us um, technological innovation and the East um, gives us a, a break, if you will. For me, I see it as East gives, gives the West a break on its innovation. My, my dad used to say, you know, we're so clever, we can innovate things that we can't spiritually, physically, or morally metabolize. And so, you know, uh, here we, we invent things and then spend five generations trying to figure out what to do with the invention. That, that, that whatever that broke things or, or made right. things dysfunctional and, and so uh so I, I don't i don't come down on one side or the other east i i, I try to embrace them both and appreciate man if it, if it weren't for the west we wouldn't have a light bulb right and we certainly wouldn't be able to do this zoom call we'd still be looking up and saying ah oh, the moon you know we'd still be saying oh wow you know the gods are you know lightning whatever uh and, and i'm not trying to denigrate or condescend to anything I think they both have tremendous assets and, and tremendous liabilities. And for me, an easy way to talk about it is just East versus West. And, right. and, and, that, that, and that in itself is simplistic, right? That's right. Uh, uh, simplistic. But, right. but, uh, but if, if, we, if, if we can't reduce something to some simple order, you know, we can never have a conversation. Yeah, no, it, it's super interesting. There was a, a course we taught last year where part one of the course, session one, I should say, the very first hour anybody was on the farm, um, we asked, we were teaching holism. This this module is about holism and holistic thinking. And we asked if anybody could have a thought and convey something to the rest of the students without reducing any of the components down, any of the relationships. They couldn't reduce anything down and they couldn't use any terminology based in reductionist thinking. So, you know, for in instance, some terminology based in that thinking is, uh, you know, I don't have the bandwidth for that, right? That, that's something that I would say. Um, in, in college, I was a math, mathematics and computer science major. And, uh, and that's just what I, the way I would think. I could literally write you an essay in zeros and ones. And, and, uh -huh. and so my, my mind is literally trained to be linear, um, you know, binary, if you will, linear in that yeah. sense. Uh -huh. yeah. um, and, and it's hard to talk that way, right? Even, even if I spend most of my time reading amazingly Eastern inspired literature. Um, and again, I'm using that as a reductionist simplistic yeah. understanding yeah. that it's more mystery and mythical, less, less rational and, and truly scientific from a uh, Western philosophy, you know, ball hits other ball and ball moves like Newtonian, <laughs> Newtonian physics. Yes. Um, you know, that, that's the way I want to live my life, but I still talk in such, such a fashion. And so I agree. I, I wish we lived in a world where the human species didn't tend towards bifurcation. Right. I mean, how cool would that be? And, and I think it's a great aspiration for us as we move forward into yes. this world, especially post pandemic, especially in this 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 modern sense where all of a sudden it's weird. I don't know if you're witnessing this. I, I feel like everybody's coming home and not necessarily home to the place in which they grew up, but home to their communities. Right. I'm seeing a, maybe this is just a rural, a rural phenomenon, right. but I know my neighbors better now than I ever have. And I think that is absolutely beautiful. And yeah. so I, I think this is a brilliant, brilliant question, Jonathan. Thank you. Yeah. Um, for, for time, Joel, I um, two more questions, it seems. So John asks, given the complexity of interests within agricultural policy, where is the inflection point where we can move from a one to a two at the federal level? So I think this goes back to your scale, one being yeah. uh, you know, gas station food and, and 10. So what is the inflection point in policy to move from a one to two at the federal level? Right. Um, I, I think that inflection point is to create uh, to create spots of freedom uh, uh, within the marketplace, whether it's to allow um, what Maine just did. Maine just created a constitutional amendment uh, to give every citizen the food of their choice from the source of their choice. So now if somebody gets in the way of me buying uh, the, the milk that I want, I can now sue, uh, sue somebody like the bureaucrat, the government that says, no, you can't have that milk. This is the first time it's happened. Uh, it, it's exciting. And so for me, I, I think the market will move 
if the market is given just a tidbit of, of freedom to exercise its own volition. And, mm. and, and so for me, it's not what can the government, the only thing, the only, the only thing I want from the government is a little, is more freedom. That's the only thing I want from the government. And, and, uh, and, and if I get that, I will, you know, I will exercise that within the marketplace and that alone op opportunity, opportunity moves innovation, innovation moves paradigm. Well, going back to the uh, the relationship example, intimacy, lovers of the land, sort of understanding it's it's that opportunity, it's the openness, right? That conversations can allow better relationships, right? right? It's um, that's that's brilliant. Last question, uh, unless somebody else wants to raise their hand, but for Joel's time, I think this could be the last question. Um, an anonymous attendee asks, if collaboration is the solution. How can we holistically integrate rural and urban communities to do two things? So how can we integrate rural and urban to do two things? The first, have access to agriculture centers like Polyface. So have access to, have access to the resources, products that support these types of systems. Um. I'm, I'm, I'm writing this down, so I'll make sure. Yeah, no, it's, uh, There's multi multifaceted question. It, it is. It's a. It's. It's. A, yeah. It's a great. It's a great question, and the, my my only. My answer, is, that. We both both rural and urban. Have to realize we're mutually interdependent, mm. and so we. So the, the question is. Which, which side are you on? Are you urban? Are you rural? If you're urban, shut off Netflix and go and go make, get some relationships with some local farmers. If you're rural, get out of your, your victimhood. The world hates me. City people don't like me, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, 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 and start doing some farm tours, start getting people out. We, right. uh, you know, for sure, one of the successes of our farm here is that we are extremely people-centric and relationship-oriented to the point now, and you know, Daniel, you've been here more than once. We don't live in the middle of town. We don't live on a super highway. We live on a dirt road. And yet we're getting, right now, we're getting about 15,000 visitors a year here at the farm on, on a dirt road. Um, and I'm not bragging, I'm just saying, we, we put great attention on the on on memory, we're, we're coming all the way full circle here back to we live in a time of memories, and I, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get teary, and I've already got chill bumps. People people who come and see the beauty, who see the healing, who see the mercy and the forgiveness. When people come, taste it, smell it, see it, touch it, caress it, they never forget. They never forget, and so. We are in that memory business. We want, we want people's memory. We want to create a better memory than Disney World, than Disneyland. We, because it's visceral. It's visceral and it's, and it's at the gut, spiritual, emotional level. And I can't tell you how many people have come here and I see them, you know, a couple months later, they've maybe they've gone on a tour, they've done something and they say, Man, you've really ruined my wife and I. We used to take Sunday drives out in the country, and now every time we go out, we just well, that's overgrazed. Look at that gully <laughs> over there. That you know, but listen, that's that's profound. That that's yeah. part of where we need to go. And yeah. so, so what we have right now, it, be, because we do polarize ourselves, what we have is is finger pointing. And if those people would just do that, and if those people would just think this way, those people would do that. And no, what we need to do is is we, we need to reach out and, and we need we need to get these you know um, um, Gucci high heeled whatever uh, you know urban urban folks out and and, and show them and, and have something frankly have something worth seeing uh, that touches them deeply and guess what they'll now with social media they'll take pictures guess where I was guess what I learned and and next thing you know their friends come. And, and this just starts that collaborative. I don't know how better to answer. I, 
I wish there was a, you know, Beautiful. magic dust that I could wave. I wish there was some, you know, a, a podcast that, that, that would reach every household in the world. But, but at the end of it, these, these changes happen one, one scab healing at a time, one wound healing at a time. They happen one at a time. And we have to leverage what, wherever we are in, in our you know, sphere of influence, Stephen Covey, and reach out and be and be the bridge. We can't sit around and wait for somebody else to make a bridge. We have to be the bridge. And uh, Daniel, I, I salute you for being part of that bridge building process. It's very, hey. very, very good. No, we're, we're thrilled to have you. And I, I couldn't agree with you more. We have a, a saying on our farm here at Timshall. Um, it's we, we, we regenerate from the soul to the soil, mm. right? And, and that soul is, is that memory, right? The soil, soil health is amazing. I don't think anybody in the regenerative movement uh, disagrees with this. I don't think anybody in understanding of the budding world of ecology and soil health and what soil does and the, all the interactions that it has would disagree yeah. that soil is important, yeah. but it's the soul that truly, truly matters. Right. We had, yeah. we gave a farm tour the other day and we had a calf born literally in front of the tour. Never could I have orchestrated it more perfectly. And yeah. it was a little bull calf and it was gorgeous. And I looked at one of the ladies who, you know, a Gucci wearing high heeled individual, yeah, yeah. not totally the person, but very similar. That's the, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the uh, idea. And I uh, said, what's its name? And she goes, what? And I was like, what's its name? Come up with its name. It has to start with an E. Its mom's name is um, Essence, I think. Essence or Ellie or something like this. And I was like, it needs to start with an E. What's its name? And so she named it Ernie. And I mean, to this day, it was a couple of months ago. To the, I mean, I get emails. Hey, how's Ernie? How's Ernie? How's Ernie? There's sure. connection, there's moments, right? That this is not a ride at Disneyland or Disney World, like you're saying, there's there's actual moments. Um, and the opposite of this, right? To circle this whole conversation back to the beginning or really to the midsection, the alternative is the eradication of moments, right? What you and I are talking about, agriculture is not the production of food. It, it, it's not to increase soil health or soil organic matter. Those are byproducts. Those things happen when you have a healthy relationship and you become a lover of the land. Yes. But it's moments, right? It's poetry, as Masanobu Fukuoka was saying. Yeah. The balance is moments. Yeah, that's right. It's beautiful. Right. It's beautiful. Um, I don't see any more questions. And so for that, we'll take it that everybody is happy. Um, I thank you, Joel, for your time. It is a blessing to have you. Thank you. Thank you for spending your Tuesday afternoon with us. Thank you, Daniel. It's been an honor and a privilege. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Have a great rest of your week.